There are no armed forces units that train the entirety of any classical FMA system. FMA systems are vast and sometimes their training methods are elaborate and take an extraordinary long time to be functional, let alone masterful. They cover a wide variety of weapon types and weapon combinations that are irrelevant or impractical for professional security forces. Like I've never seen a cop or soldier perform double expandable baton sinawali on duty. This is a good time to talk about attribute building. For example, espada y dago or double stick can be a good training exercise for developing movement relationship between left and right hemispheres, right? Baton and pepper spray, flashlight and baton, knife and gun. However, these are generalized attribute development exercises that may not necessarily translate appropriately. For this reason, it is most often martial arts enthusiasts with professional security force occupations that gain the most benefit from such practices and not the entirety of a unit who may have a finite window of time to train such things. Now this brings me to my next point, training time and training prioritization. Let me be perfectly clear that for the most part, empty hand combatives are deprioritized in armed forces training. It shouldn't, but it is. And now would be a good time to talk about law enforcement versus military training relating to empty hand or non-ballistic weaponry training. Patrol cops get a lot of on-duty training and experiences when it comes to putting hands on people. Soldiers generally do not. Now there are exceptions to this, but for the most part this holds true. For this reason, it is entirely more appropriate for cops to get solid empty hand combative training than a soldier might, for example. Again, with some exceptions. Now when it comes to military training, defensive knife tactics are so far down the list of training priorities. Even in the special forces community, there are so many hard and soft skills to learn that knife work is rarely prioritized. And this makes sense, doesn't it? Given the amount of time it takes to master knife work, it would serve soldiers more appropriately to learn mission specific elements of knife work rather than learning the entire thing. And this brings me to my next point. Defensive knife courses that do best for law enforcement and military are distilled, scaled down, super practical, easy to learn, easy to retain, and supremely functional, but limited comparative to the scope of what could be learned from any classical system. For this reason, what is most often taught isn't the entirety of a classical system, but a distillation of what works relative to the task and conditions they might face. Now, to get a deep and profound understanding of what mission specific really means, well, you probably need to do the damn job. Meaning to say folks with relevant law enforcement and military experience have the best chance at distilling classical systems into their functional derivatives to serve their brothers and sisters to a higher degree of relevance. Now I'm not saying that civilian instructors have nothing to offer to professional armed security units, only that they aren't on the same level of understanding how specific elements of an art can play a functional role on duty. In fact, there are many FMA masters who have served temporary training roles to security forces. These are typically one-off or limited time engagements and they aren't normally called back. Many special forces units, for example, make it a point to get exposure to all sorts of things just by virtue of needing to check them out, just in case there might be something there. And often, backdoor personal relationships are what facilitates this engagement to begin with. Not that the system was particularly spectacular, but that someone was friends with someone on the inside. This happens way more than people realize. So what are the points I'm trying to make here? Let's get to it. One, that law enforcement professionals get the most hands-on interaction with criminal elements that we are likely to face on a day-to-day -day basis. This makes them ideal resources to distill FMA or any martial arts system to work under a self-defense capacity. Now a difference worth noting is that cops are typically armed with guns and so even their expression of self-defense for FMA lean towards using it as a transitionary option. And as the threat escalates, so must the tools used to neutralize them. I don't mean to say that only law enforcement professionals can teach self-defense. In fact, their context is so different from the civilian context that we ought to be very careful and mindful about what we choose to incorporate into our self-defense matrix as civilians. 
The best educators in martial arts who have a law enforcement background will be able to delineate this for you, but be warned that that isn't always the case. And do remember that some law enforcement experiences are more relevant than others. While all of their service is appreciated, they don't all do the same job. A narcotics cop or a SWAT operator in a big city will have acquired a vastly different set of experiences than a traffic cop in a relatively safe jurisdiction, for example. Now, the second point is not to be so enamored by so-called military training. Their knife training is prioritized so much lower than all the other badass skills they need to learn, develop, and maintain, and what they may end up learning may be mission or unit specific and may not be as relevant to you as they may be to them. Keep in mind, again, that there will be specific exceptions to these generalizations. My third point is that some FMA masters will cite their knife engagement experiences as the ultimate metric for validity over what they teach. Be careful of this. Many of these stories present exaggerations, embellishments, and are sometimes outright lies. Never mind that alcohol might have been involved. Never mind that these events may have underlying cultural cues that escalated violence that simply don't apply to where you live. Many countries have violent drinking cultures, for example, and these ego-based engagements don't often meet the criteria for self-defense in most modern countries. No court in North America will absolve you of guilt just because some trolls interrupted your drunken karaoke night. Now, the problem with attaching personal experiences relating to knife engagements is that no matter how severe they may be, they are limited to the totality of experience of one individual. The specific circumstances that play out with their personal experiences do not account for what might be called a credible collection of data. People get lucky, and memory re recollection under stress is unreliable. This might explain why so many of these stories seem almost unbelievable. FMA masters will have a very high tendency to prioritize skills and techniques that may have saved their lives that one time as representing the totality of potential events. This is natural, but as students, be wary of using your master's stories as a kind of self-validation. This is extremely dangerous. So now you know why it's highly improbable that any armed security forces will train the entirety of an FMA system and why you, as the individual, should take great care in the assessment of your skills and capabilities relative to what you've been training. Now you know why we shouldn't be so enamored by military knife training, because while practical, they are limited and might be because of a backdoor relationship. And now you know the limitations of the individual FMA master when it comes to assessing validity. So now what do we do? Well, as many of you already do, you will continue to train the Filipino martial arts because of multi-layered and personal reasons, because it makes us feel good, because it's great to keep the body moving in interesting and beneficial ways, because we love the art and culture. My only hope is that you are careful and mindful when assessing the validity of FMA as a self-defense system not because it's invalid, but because the variety of presentations, methods, systems, techniques, and concepts is so big and so vast that it really does necessitate us, the individual practitioner, to take it upon ourselves to be in the driver's seat of this continuous process of self-assessment, testing, and validation, and not to be complacent or reliant on any one external source. Keep an open mind, guys. Diversify your training and have a lot of fun in the process. My name is Paulo Rubio, aka GN. Thank you guys very much for watching FMA Source. These are my opinions and do not represent anybody else's opinions. Let me know what you think in the comments below and please do consider subscribing to the channel. And if you enjoyed this particular video, do me a favor, really helps us out. Give it a thumbs up. Until next time, keep training FMA. Peace.